We can we can talk about after you get your results. But uh, this goes to show you need to be practicing your homework more, I think. Because they were all homework questions, weren't they? So make sure you're doing your homework and everything will be okay. Right, let's continue. Did you get your maths results? Do you all know your student number? We don't know student cards, your NCUK student number. Do you know it? No? Okay. Right, thermodynamics. So let's have a look at what this word means. So what does thermo mean? Heat, yeah. And dynamics? motion or change uh, like this. So thermodynamics is really the study of the movement of heat, the behavior of heat, okay? Mm, okay. Right, so thermodynamics is a part of physics that studies the movement of heat between different objects. I think it's enough for you to write down just the first sentence gets everything. Okay, got that? Yeah. Now, thermodynamics also studies the change in pressure and volume of objects, and statistics is also used. Thermodynamics is useful because it helps us understand the world of the very small in relation to the, the world of the very large. So, what thermodynamics is useful for is taking things like um, all the atoms in this table and looking at it as one system rather than of many atoms. So, and, yeah, micro to macro. We kind of saw a little bit of this already when we looked at all the molecules in the box and then got a formula from looking at the atom to looking at the whole system. This is kind of the idea. We've seen this already with the formula energy equals 3 over 2 PV. And we also know that PV equals NKT. So let's see what happens if we put them together, which we had a look at earlier today. So we had energy, or rather kinetic energy, is 3 over 2, is that what I said? 2 PV, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we also know that PV equals NK, if I use the big N, T. So I can get, if I put 1 into 2, I can get Ke equals 3 over 2 NKT. Yes? But this guy here is constant, isn't it? As long as it's closed, it's constant. So you get this result, which we actually said earlier today. Ke is proportional to temperature. Okay? Or even, if you want to be even clearer about it, this is actually total kinetic energy. So you could even divide by the N, total kinetic energy divided by N equals 3 over 2 KT. Now what would be total energy divided by N? What would that represent? What would be? Yeah, average. It's the average kinetic energy is you could also say it's proportional to temperature yes now what is that saying so imagine you have your molecules and they're moving around 
and then you were to suddenly see the temperature multiplied by two, what would happen to the kinetic energy? The, the kinetic energy would double. Yeah. Or look at it the other way around too. If these are going with a speed v and then they the speed doubles, what happens? Yeah, what happens to the temperature? It increases. How much? Does it double? No, it actually more than doubles. Four times, yeah. Because kinetic energy is a half m v squared. So when you double the v, you quadruple the kinetic energy, which means you quadruple the temperature. Quad meaning four times, okay? Why is this interest nor important? Well, oh, the other interesting thing is what happens if uh, the kinetic energy is zero. What's the temperature? If you were to say use this formula, if the total kinetic energy is zero, what's the temperature? Zero, zero Kelvin. Mm -hmm. So, what are the molecules doing at zero Kelvin? They're stationary. Okay. So we can conclude that. We get there eventually, blah, blah, blah. This is all I'm saying. We have this formula, which I, I proved. And this is a very important result. And it's, I'm just writing everything I, I said. No temperature means no kinetic energy, which means no movement. So uh, what might you want to write down from here? Um, I, think, I think this is important. So sorry, I'll just put this down here, Zach. This is one, this is two. This is 1 into 2, which gives us that, which gives us that. And that's an important uh, result then. Go ahead, Zach. So when you're doing the potential and kinetic energy yeah. questions, huh? yeah. we consider that the object, whatever it is, yeah. none of its molecules are moving. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So the whole, uh, what would you call it? Approach? No. Path of physics is you add more and more detail yeah. to the problem, you know? So if we said something is at rest, it's not really at rest. Yeah, but can something really be something, you know? <laughs> like whenever you define something, you yeah. can always say, yeah, but is it really that? Like if I said to you, what color is your hair? You tell me, what color is your hair? Is it really black though? Because there might be some molecules of different colour in it. So it might be yeah. blackish, you know. So it can be diff difficult to say something is something. So you have to be a bit flexible, you know. Okay. You got that little proof? Yeah. It was, I think, one of the questions as well. Wasn't that question one, perhaps? Okay, continue. Or we just assume that the system is in zero Kelvin. <laughs> I suppose that's one other way of doing it, yeah. But as long as the container is closed and heat is not being transmitted outside, it doesn't really matter what's happening with the molecules inside. Okay, got that? Yep. So, let's see what's next. Ah, some definitions. So, Internal energy U of a material. Does anyone know what this might mean? You can look at the look at the, the word internal energy. Yeah, but what form would that energy be? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What's what's this type of energy called? You? Yeah. Kinetic energy. Yeah. It's the sum of the kinetic and potential energies. So the internal energy is also called the total heat energy. Uh, as a formula, it's simply U is the sum of all the energies, which is all the kinetics and potentials. Now, uh, it's enough just to write down the first sentence and the formula. First sentence and the formula, I think, is enough.
You got that? Yeah. Um, so, the potential energy part we often don't care about. We said we imagine that part's usually zero. So really for us, the internal energy is all the kinetic energies, really. But could be potential energy too. Um, I don't think we'll concern ourselves too much with that. Right. This Brownian motion business, we already talked about it. Does anyone remember what Brownian motion is? Yeah. Yeah, what was the word we used? It's a random walk motion. Um, so we've already done this question, which is to describe an experiment that demonstrates Brownian motion. Do we remember what the experiment is? What do you do? You have the box with the light source and the microscope and the smoke, and you can see the smoke particles moving in a random walk. And what do we conclude from this experiment? Do we remember? Yeah. The air gas is made up of unseen molecules that are colliding randomly with the seen smoke molecules. So it gives evidence for the molecule theory, you know. Um, so, formal definition, Brown. Well, uh, did I give you the definition? I kind of did, didn't I? Yeah. Brownian motion is the random motion of particles suspended in a fluid. Uh, which is liquid or gas. Yeah, what did I say previously when I made it up? Oh, no, I just, because I completely agree with that definition from Sarah. Fine. I think you mentioned that this is compound. Oh, okay. So it, you could guess the definition nearly. It's a random motion of particles suspended in a fluid resulting from their collision with the fast moving molecules in the fluid. But I would also, yeah, gas is classed as a fluid. Because you, when you talk about fluid dynamics, you're studying the motion of liquid and gases. Often because the equations are quite similar. You know. something closed to blind? Mm -hmm. No, that's... Huh? It's way better like that. What is? Yeah. Okay. I guess you can see okay, huh? Continue? No, not yet. Please don't damage your brain. You'll make your next physics test harder. Even, <laughs> Even harder. Right, continue? Yeah. Heat is a form of energy. Remember we said this in the energy lesson, heat's a form of energy. It's not a, uh, a physical substance. You can't hold heat like some kind of superhero. Um, heat has no mass. Heat can move, from, but heat can move from one place to another in different ways. In thermodynamics, heat means energy which is moved between two things when one of them is hotter than the other. So. You know, I'm trying to think of something like if I had a cup of coffee in my hand, I can feel the heat moving from the coffee to my hand. Okay, um, but heat is not the same thing as temperature, right? They're not the same. They're different ideas, and I'll give you an example to explain it. So you need to focus now. Okay, let me explain the difference. The temperature is a measure of the average speed, or rather the average kinetic energy. Remember we said if the temperature increases, then what happens to the speed? It increases, yeah? And vice versa, okay? That's temperature. It measures the average kinetic energy. This means 
that a swimming pool at 20 Celsius has more heat energy than a cup of coffee at 80. So if I have a swimming pool at 20, that has more heat energy than a cup of coffee at 80. Because the swimming pool has many molecules and all that kinetic energy, which is heat, is more than the kinetic energy in a small cup of coffee. Even though we say the cup of coffee is hotter. When we use that word hot, we're not talking about heat. We're talking about temperature. Yeah. Now this is very confusing English. Okay. So if I said, what well, now? This is hotter than this. I'm saying this has more temperature, higher temperature than this. Okay. I'm not saying it has more heat energy. Okay. It's possible that this is hotter but has less heat energy. I know that might seem very confusing. You have to be careful with the English here. So let's just practice some examples. Um, let's think about this room. Um, let's compare it to, oh, what can we compare it to? Uh, the computer, which would be hotter? Which would be hotter? The hotter would be the computer. Yes, has a higher temperature. Now, which would have more heat, though? Would all the air molecules vibrating in this room have more heat energy than no. that? Yes. I think maybe the room might have more heat energy. I think maybe so. Because what is there going to be? How much, how much air would be in this room? Like five, five, five. Like maybe, <coughs> five, maybe, maybe 25 kilograms? 25, 25 kilograms of air molecules vibrating slowly, I feel like will have more energy than whatever, one or two kilograms vibrating much faster. I don't know. Anyways, I just want you to get the idea. So, what precisely is heat or thermal energy, or sorry, properties of it? So, it can be transferred from one body to another, right? You can measure it. It's not a material substance. And it's a form of energy. These are sort of four key features of, of heat. Um, the first feature, you can transfer heat. Would you say that is true or false for most types of energy? True. I think that's true for other types of energy too, that you can usually transfer it. Yeah. Secondly, uh, it's a measurable quantity. Would you say that's true or false for most types of energy? I would say it's true. Although sometimes it can be difficult, maybe, to measure the other forms of energy, um, like... No, actually, I think it's okay to measure them all. It's not a material substance. Now, this gets, starts getting a, a, a little bit difficult. So s other, some other forms of energy are really related to the material, you know? like um, a cake you know it's really hard to separate the cake from the energy in the cake whereas with heat that's easier to do <coughs> if i have something which is hot and i want to take the heat out of this well i just need to put it in contact with something and the heat can drain out it's kind of hard to do that with other forms of energy like maybe uh food but it's easy with other forms too like uh uh, electricity. How is heat lost? Huh? When it's not in contact. It's not. It's not. So this is the thing. You know, if you were in, uh, if you were in a spaceship, and someone pushed you out the window, um, 
you think you would feel cold, but it takes it'll take you a while to cool down because there's not really any material for the heat to transfer to in the vacuum. Yeah, if you were in a perfect vacuum, you you would only lose heat slowly because maybe some sweat might be coming off of you or some skin might be coming off you, like flakes of skin, you know? You'd be losing it very slowly. So that would be good DNI. It would be the lack of air that would be the first oh, concern, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's not the cold. The cold isn't going to get you. It's the so lack of air. What's that? It, it, it very very slowly it would take a long time like if you think you push out the window and then you freeze in a few minutes no That's what the movies yeah, yeah I know yeah it's, 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 it's not accurate at all it'll take you a long time to freeze I don't know days yeah yeah there's nothing really the vacuum isn't a, a pure vacuum there'll be some stray dust particles and, and, and things like this and also you don't forget you're shredding you're, you're you're shedding skin and hair this will carry away some heat energy you know um but slowly slowly yeah yeah what movie had people freezing as they were kicked out lots of yeah. Yeah. not not accurate not accurate um, also, if you were suddenly in a spaceship and kicked out the window, oil, gas, and blood, and you try and escape. yeah, I think it's very, very important. If you ever find yourself in a spaceship and you're in the airlock and you're about to be ejected, okay, you really want to make sure you fully exhale before you're ejected. So you might be tempted to think the best thing to do is to hold your breath and go, <gasps> no, because then your lungs will go. So, uh, what you need to do is fully exhale. Uh, how long would you get? Probably get a minute or two. You should hold in your breath. No, fully, yeah, yeah, but you'll still be alive as you're passed out. You'll be dead after two minutes, I'd say. <laughs> uh, 10 or 20 seconds will be fine. There'll be no long term consequences after that. Uh, after that, there'll be problems then. Okay, you got that? Don't worry, I don't imagine many of you be in a spaceship any time in the next few years. Unless Richard Branson really uh, is a success with his Virgin... What's it, Virgin Galactic? No, his space one. Galactic, isn't it? Yeah. All right, you got that? Yeah. So, um, heat supplied, Q. What's this now? Well, this is what I call the heat that you pump into a system. Now we don't have it in this room, but if you had a, a, a heater in this room, the heat energy coming out of this into the room, that's the cue. That's the heat being supplied to the room. Yeah? You understand the, the concept? I say pumped. It's like you're pushing heat into the system. You know? It's like a heater. It's making Resistor. Yeah. So those atoms are vibrating. Yes. Yeah. Colliding with the air. air. Yeah. To heat it up. Yeah. And then what happens is the air rises out of the radiator, and then the colder air comes in underneath. <coughs> Electric heaters are very simple devices. Really, you could make one at home yourself. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's it. Um, you just need a resistor, which you can buy on eBay for like a dollar or two dollars. Nick Chrome is a good resistor. And you want to maybe weave that into some kind of zigzag pattern mm -hmm. and put that at the base yeah, of a, a base of a metal container. And that's it. It's very simple to make an electric heater. Um, for example, a train engine works because it gets heat cue from the burning of coal. And this is converted into work. Um, I just I, I give you an example just with a picture of the train. Yeah, you all know what a train is. Well, there's a picture of one. Oh, yeah, indeed, yeah. Right. Uh, so, what you have here is 
Uh, you have heat here in the engine, obviously. So what this does is uh, it provides the Q. So the Q, the Q is like an input, if that makes sense. And then what happens to the train? The train will go forward. So that's a, a work. So the work is like an output. So what you would love to happen is to say the Q provided by the coal heat energy gets converted into uh, work. Although it doesn't completely. What else is happening? This is heat loss, isn't it? So the whole train will get warm. You don't really want the whole train to get warm, do you? You just want all the heat from the engine to go into works. It's like efficiency, isn't it? So what happens is, oh, you get output and an increase in internal energy. Now, we'll talk more about this in a minute. Um, before we do that, some definitions. Two physical systems are in thermal equilibrium. What does that mean? Yes, yeah, same what? Oh. Basically, they have the same temperature, which is, uh, can be said in a more fancy way. Um, no heat flows between them when they're connected by a path permeable to heat. What the heck does permeable to heat mean? Say again? Accessible? They can see through? Yeah, yeah. Uh, permits. If you, connect, if you connect two objects with a path that allows the heat to travel, but the heat does not travel, then they are in equilibrium. Which is a fancy way of saying that the same temperature. Yeah, okay, so you can write that down. Okay, you got that definition box? So, tell me this. Does this room feel hot or cold? Cold. Cold. So this means you are not in thermal equilibrium with the room. Heat is leaving your body. Does your chair feel hot or cold? You didn't notice, perhaps. Uh, this means you're in thermal equilibrium with your chair. No heat is being exchanged. Yeah. Although, if I put my hand on this, I can feel some heat from the computer. So the heat is being lost from the computer and entering my hand. Okay. Um, right. So here's the example again with the engine. Q is the heat pumped into the engine from burning the coal. Delta U is the change in internal energy of the water. Now, it's not just the water, really. It's the whole engine. Uh, and W is the work done. So if we were to try and make a formula here, the Q is the heat from the coal, and this causes two things to happen. What does it cause to happen? It causes the water and the engine to get hotter, obviously, and it causes the train to move. So the formula is, you could say, is Q equals delta U plus W, which I mentioned uh, here as well. This is just a form of what rule? What rule is this really just a form of? It's really just a form of conservation of energy, isn't it? The energy provided, the Q, should equal the energy at the end, which is the delta U and the W. Right? Yeah? Um, the conservation of energy states that Q equals delta U plus W. Yeah? No. I think what is enough for you to write down is this formula.
Just this formula. You got that? Okay. In, so, this is a way to take heat and to make work. Right? You burn coal, then what happens? The water becomes steam, and the steam pushes the piston and the train goes forward. <coughs> so you can take the heat and make a work. Right? But is the opposite possible? Is it possible to take some work and use that to produce heat? And the answer is yes. Um, I'll, I'll draw the picture. Uh, James Prescott Jewell was the person to first do this experiment. He had a very uh, simple way of doing this. So what he did was um, he had um, oh, what wait, uh, had a, a picture there. He had a little weight here. And this was connected up to a pulley, and then this was connected up to a pulley, and and then uh, this was connected into a special wheel system. I'm, I'm simplifying it, but this is M here. This has a potential energy, doesn't it? So what happens is this falls down. Oh, I, I'm sorry. This was this was wound up as well here. There was, anyways. This falls down, and this moves, and this moves up, and then of course this spins around in the water. And he stuck a thermometer in here and measured the temperature. <coughs> and what did he discover? Well, the water got hotter. In fact, uh, the amount of heat gained here equaled potential energy he actually did this uh, in real life too he had um, at the top of a waterfall you know a waterfall so he took uh, the temperature here then he climbed down and took the temperature here and uh, which is bigger? T2 is bigger. Because what happened is this water here has a potential energy. <coughs> when it's at the bottom, it doesn't have this potential energy. And the kinetic energy is the same because the water is flowing at the same speed. So where did this potential energy go? It became heat energy. You, I think, uh, I think something like... 100 meters is one degree or something. I can't remember, but you can calculate it. We, we'll do that later, actually. So here's this simple little machine. Uh, you drop the weight, and then it spins around. And with the thermometer here, you can measure the... Uh, you can see that the work is converted into heat then, okay? Um, you don't need this experiment in the exam. I just want you to understand the idea that you can make heat do work and you can have work produce heat. It goes both directions. Okay? Um, no, I don't like this one. Okay. Uh, right, so, after all this, we can finally get to the laws of thermodynamics, the, the, the rules of how heat behaves. So, the first law is called the zero law. And the zero law of thermodynamics states, oh, actually, I don't know if anyone knows it. The zero law? No. If two thermodynamic systems are in equilibrium with a third, then they're in equilibrium with each other. Which is a fancy way of saying, if A is the same temperature as C, and B is the same temperature of C, then that means, what's the relationship between A and B? They are also the same temperature. So obvious that it's not even given a number. It's called the zero law of thermodynamics. Uh, if you can write that down. It seems so obvious, right? If I'm the same temperature as Lynn, and Lynn is the same temperature as Harry, then it means I must be the same temperature as Harry. You know, it's obvious. Oh, 
Okie dokie. Thermal equilibrium. Which means they have the same amount of heat. No, no goodness, no. No, 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 no. They're just the same temperature. But they could have hugely different heat energy stored in them. So uh, if I. What temperature is a human temperature? 37, isn't it? If I jump into a, a pool of water at 37 <coughs> Celsius, I might not really feel any heat exchange. Although in real life I will, because it's more complicated. But anyways, um, but the, the the water I'm in has much more heat in it. You know. So equilibrium just means the same temperature. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, technically it means if they're in contact, they're not exchanging heat energy. And the temperature will be or you don't even exchange temperature. Well, it's a little bit more complicated with the water. You see. <coughs> We have to talk about this more later. Uh, like, which which would you rather stand in? Would you rather stand in water at 12 Celsius or stand in air at 12 Celsius? Now, logically, it shouldn't matter because you're both standing in a thing of 12 Celsius, but the water will feel colder than the air. So it's there's much more complicated things going on, uh, which we'll have to talk about later. Okay. Because it's to do with things with how good a conductor is and heat capacities, and it, it gets more complicated than just this. Right, the first law of thermodynamics. Does anyone know this one? Does anyone know any of the laws of thermodynamics? No. Okay, the first law of thermodynamics is a version of the conservation of energy. And that is, you know the formula I gave you earlier? Normally we write it in this form. Delta U equals Q minus W. What did I say earlier? Uh, Q equals delta U plus W, wasn't it? Yeah. So, who's doing engineering? Like, um, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, so this is like a mechanical engineering idea. You're saying that the gain in heat energy internally of the engine is equal to uh, the heat energy provided minus the work output of the engine. You know. That also assumes a more energy scale. No, no it doesn't. No. No, I wouldn't say you're assuming 100% efficiency. You're just assuming other form, ignoring other forms of energy like yeah. heat and uh, not heat, uh, sound. Okay, lastly, we're doing okay? Yeah. Lastly, the second law of thermodynamics says that heat cannot spontaneously flow from cold to hot without external work being performed on the system. So that means if I have a cup of hot coffee beside a cup of cold coffee, what will happen? The heat from the cold will go. Sorry, the heat from the hot will go into the cold until they're balanced. You never see the cold coffee get colder and the hot coffee get hotter. The heat doesn't flow the other way. It flows from the hot to the cold. Okay. Um, if you want the heat to go from the cold to the hot, you're going to have to do some work to make that happen. You're going to have to have some machine that takes the heat out of the cold coffee and makes it colder and puts that heat into the uh, hot coffee. Now, there are machines that do that. And then like a freezer. Kind of, yes, just like a freezer. There are machines that you can get that will take heat out of something cold and make it colder and use that heat to put into something hot and make it hotter. Um, you can get these for your homes, although they're not used really so you could have a, a, a heater on the window that takes the heat from the outside cold oh, yeah, it's in the and makes the outside colder 
and then puts that heat into the inside of the house. These are called heat pumps. Now, heat pumps work well when the temperature inside the house is not much different to the temperature outside the house. This is not the case here. Um, but I would imagine in perhaps some countries it would be more affordable to have heat pumps rather than heaters. You know, how do heaters work in Ireland? You make lots of heat, you fill up the room with heat and then the heat leaks out. You know, how do heat pumps work? They take the heat from the outside they would work in and push it in. You know, perfect maybe insulate the house. What would? Uh, a heat pump. Just yeah, just but no, the, a, a, a normal heat would work better. Well, yeah, yeah, you, you uh, the difference is heat pumps work very well when the difference inside and outside isn't much. Uh, but they don't work so well when there's a big difference. You know? Think about it like this, which is easier to do? If you have some water up here and water <coughs> down here, and you want to pump the water back up, okay? That is easier to do when they're already close together. That's what's happening. Okay. Uh, whereas if there's a very big difference and you need more water, then it may, rather than trying to pump it from low to high, maybe it's just easier to pour some water in. You know. Anyways, uh, we're going a bit off topic here. These are the three rules of thermodynamics. First one. If A is in equal, if A and B are in equilibrium with C, then A is in equilibrium with B. Second rule is conservation of energy, and third rule is an obvious rule: heat only goes from hot to cold, never cold to hot, unless you're doing some kind of work with a machine that can do this for you. Yeah, is that okay? Do you have those three rules? Yes. Because it's so blooming obvious, it's not worth giving a number. That's why. True. You see this in physics. When a rule is so simple, it gets a zero. But then when you said the three laws... It's there are three laws. You just start counting at zero. You know? Okay. Uh, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Good. Finished.